section. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to our Getting Serious About Leisure session. So during this session, we are going to share with you our wisdom and our insights from launching our Serious Leisure podcast. Um, it's the Serious Leisure podcast is a collaborative uh, endeavor and it involves the three of us, so Sam, Kat, uh, and myself. In the podcast context, Sam provides our serious leisure expertise. He is an expert in serious leisure. Um, Kat provides her expertise as leading the UE Center for Music. So a, a kind of an institution within our institution that supports a serious leisure pursuit for both staff and students. Um, and I bring my expertise as Associate Director of Academic Practice, supporting early career academics and also kind of personal um, and uh, collegial experiences of uh, discussing well-being and struggles with work-life balance and also encountering a serious leisure pursuit as the revelation of how I can balance my own work and life um, uh, balance. Uh, and that's the um, the three core contributors to our podcast and the three core speakers for today. So uh, this session would be run uh, with no slides. Um, each of us are, are going to speak for about five minutes. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion around three core questions. And it's a small group so we can veer in whichever direction we, um, we want. So um, before I begin, I need to emphasize that um, you can all, given that it's a small group, you can all put comments, questions, interrupt, and just free flow um, throughout the presentation. So, um, and if you feel comfortable, you can switch your camera on, uh, you can switch your mic on as if, as and when you, you wish and you want to contribute. Before I continue any further, can I ask you all to put in the chat any leisure that you engage with that you think you might be engaging with seriously, i.e. any leisure that you're engaging with on an ongoing basis that's really part of your life and your lifestyle. So just to have an idea what examples we might draw on as we continue uh, with our discussion. <laughs> Hoovering Jen. <laughs> Like your garden cat looking after chickens nice we have an episode around looking after animals in the serious leisure podcast that might be um, of interest walking crochet uh, gardening uh, etc super we'll come back to those um, in a minute uh, so let me just give you a little bit of context of the podcast and the thinking and the topic of the podcast and this um, this talk much has been written in higher education about neoliberalism, managerialist approaches to higher education, um, overwork, burnout. Um, I've recently encountered the literature around greedy institutions. Um, this has all kind of captured the lived experiences of us working in the higher education sector, where our hours of working have you know, gradually creeped and being increased. And that's the case in the UK, but also in, in other countries. So, um, again, recently I was engaging with some of the literature in the Australian context, for example. Um, summer period is just coming, we're in the middle of it and it's being squeezed out. So that, that time for recharging or contemplative work um, or indeed holidays is, is becoming um, more and more difficult. Um, our work-life balance in higher education, in academia, has become more and more unbalanced. Um, and of course, COVID amplified this. <laughs> COVID made everything so much worse. We were mostly stuck working from home, um, and those boundaries between work and life became even further blurred, and it was even more difficult to draw the line and stop the working day. Um, and separate that from your kind of personal life um, and, and other, in other interests or endeavors. Um, so we came up with the idea of the podcast as a space to really think and talk about leisure, 
to unpack our stories, um, to share insights, to inspire each other about how we manage or not, or how we struggle and how we balance or unbalance our lives um, it, with regards to, to, to leisure. Um, with the utmost conviction that leisure pursuits can have a fundamental impact on our well-being. Um, and that conviction is informed by personal experiences, by working with staff and students, and also by research and scholarship that we, we've kind of engaged with. So the podcast is a space to share fascinating stories and struggles with balancing leisure work and well-being. We have guests who come and talk about the different leisure pursuits, and we spend a fair bit of time reflecting and unpacking what these pursuits are the struggles, the tribulations, and the, the, the amazing moments that happen with, um, with experiencing leisure. We are also very conscious that we want to create a space where the discourse about leisure in higher education becomes legitimized. Um, and the example I always give is that when we come back to work on a Monday, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, our water cooler moment, we talk about the fascinating and interesting leisure pursuits that we've done that weekend and not comparing and competing with who's worked how many hours over the weekend to catch up with, with work. So those, those um, conversations about leisure in, the, in academia become legitimized. I'm going to conclude with a couple of um, kind of remarks with regards to the literature. One that uh, struck me was around reading um, around um, greedy institutions. Um, and there is a quote about that, I'll kind of try to read an abbreviated version of this. Many academics often commit themselves totally to their work, allowing little for private life or themselves and their families. And the more academics invest in their work, the greater work has a hold over them. Um, and then academics cannot give enough time to their teaching or their research. There's always students who need more help. There are always more books and articles to read. There's always more research that needs to be published. And there are always ideas that needs to be researched. And academic work, um, uh, so Carrie et al. Re reference Aker, who basically talk about academic work being like housework, it's never really done. Um, so there's, a, there's an aspect of what it is to work in academia that makes this conversation about leisure really important. And of course, there's also the point of view of, we're all struggling with work-life balance, that's wider in the society. So what responsibility do we have as higher education institutions to develop graduates who already have tools and ways of balancing and reading, leading balanced lives, not only successful lives, not only employable lives, not only lives in terms of earning good sal salaries, but also lives where they're already able to, to balance work and leisure. So this is a wider context of our podcast. I'll pass now to Kat to give you a little bit more insight from her perspective. Thanks so much, Petia. So, yes, it's been a very interesting question we've been, been addressing, particularly around this area of legitimacy you were hearing Petia alluding to there, that the more our identities, especially those of us working in higher education, become associated with those professional roles, the less legitimate those other parts of ourselves can start to become. So perhaps we might not talk about them at all. In fact, there can even be an idea that if we've got time for leisure, then we're not working as hard as our colleagues. Um, that perhaps we're, uh, we're not putting in as much effort or heaven forbid, we don't have as much expertise. So this huge emphasis on our work identities makes it even harder to make decisions around prioritizing these, these different aspects of ourselves. So with the podcast, we've been trying to encourage colleagues to challenge this culture and to operate in the absolute opposite direction by introducing their leisure pursuits as legitimate. And this is where the serious leisure discourse is particularly important because it adds weight by evidence as to why um, those pursuits need to be protected and celebrated. 
I'm going to let Sam talk about serious leisure in terms of the literature when he speaks in a few minutes. But I would like to talk a little bit about um, what the practice of trying to deliver opportunities for serious leisure within a higher edu education institution is like. So uh, the Centre for Music that I lead, uh, it often requires a lot of explanation because it's extremely anomalous. And this straight away tells us something about attitudes to serious leisure within higher education. So we hear a lot of talk about uh, mental health and self-care, but we don't see a lot of action in our institutions always. Um, and we have a lot of maybe a lot of initiatives and suggestions about uh, mindfulness or taking time outside and this kind of thing. But it's actually quite difficult if it's all on us as individuals to do. So having something like the Centre for Music here on campus is, is really interesting and it's quite a, an innovative approach because in theory students or staff could pop in on their lunch break and have a little noodle on a piano and the fact of our existence straight away gives that endorsement and legitimacy. Um, we also uh, we have a lot of stuff staffed and a lot of stuff that isn't so people can come and dip into our facilities to do what it is they want to do or they can come and have a more structured experience at whatever at whatever level they want to but one of the interesting challenges we found within higher education is encouraging our colleagues in particular to dispense with a culture of expertise and of um, that kind of um, that perfectionism that comes from having a career dedicated to our particular areas of, of specialism and a challenge can come in, in sort of seeing the value in starting again with something, especially if it's not going to lead into our professional lives. We can have a sense of, yeah, well, uh, I'm never going to be a professional pianist, so what's the point in starting that? Or, ah, I'd feel uncomfortable singing because I'm probably not a very good singer. I like to stick to my strong suit. Um, now, those of us who are involved in teaching and learning... This is a really sad scenario because going through and refreshing those processes of learning something new keeps us in contact with uh, the student experience. But more than that, in terms of well-being, the focus of our discussion today, we're missing out on an enormous area. So when we look at areas where we can develop well-being and we might look at things like um, relaxation, this kind of thing, learning something new is one of the most significant proactive things that we can do for ourselves to refresh our well-being and to re-energize ourselves and that requires us to lay down the mantle of being the expert and to kind of put away all our previous learning and those kind of powerful roles that we that we hold within our expertise and to go back to the beginning and go okay well I don't know anything what have you got and th this is my great passion at Centre for Music is making those spaces so I, I love working with musicians who are experienced and kind of trying new things within their kind of music, um, amateur and professional careers. But my favourite moments, truly, are sitting down with somebody, whether it's a student or a staff member, for maybe the first time in years in front of a piano and that wonder experience that we have when we learn something new. And that wonder experience has come through in our discussions with colleagues, whether they're standing in a river fly fishing or whether they're getting up in the night delivering baby lambs or whether they're singing in a community choir. There's a wonder associated when we try something again from the beginning and it does, it does really good things for us. So I will just briefly mention that from uh, in the kind of arts area, arts and health is really developing a fantastic literature base here, as, as you can imagine. We, uh, some studies have shown that um, singing in a group will encourage serotonin to be released in the brain. It doesn't happen if you're on your own in the shower, I'm sad to say. It does other good things for you, but that social aspect is really important. And again, a very interesting theme we've seen in the podcast, the way those social relationships can be critical, especially within the leisure space, because there's a different dynamic um, also that learning to play a musical instrument can help us with our concentration and Petia may roll her eyes here, but can take us into, into a flow state, which, which some people are like, don't talk to me about flow state, but actually, uh, those of us who like to sometimes do something a bit solo with our leisure, that state can be a very re-energizing space and the last thing is that that musicking that can be done that I see in the center can be a place where people express different identities so we can have a break from being our professional selves and we can find some other more playful selves beginner selves 
creative selves that are not just about what we bring to the workplace. I'm going to hand back to Fatia. Thanks, Kat. I have nothing against the concept of flow. <laughs> Sam is an expert on flow and he talked to anybody today if he wants to, to talk about that. This is an internal myth within our team that, <laughs> that I have something against the concept of flow. Um, Kat, uh, Sam, if you would allow me, we can be a bit more flexible because it's a small group. There is a question for Kat in the chat um, around uh, from, from Fran. Uh, she likes the idea of a drop-in center and asks if there is an institutional pre pressure to legit legitimize the center by offering conventional academic programs. So Kat, would you would like to answer this, please? Of course, yes. Fran, that's such an insightful question and shows that you have an excellent grasp of the dynamics of higher education. So um, generally speaking, we're quite fortunate that we're able to resist the occasional tide that can arise about, well, what are these academics doing floating around doing well-being stuff? Shouldn't they be doing a program? Uh, we, we're generally able to navigate that because of the current zeitgeist about mental health, well-being, stress and whatever. Nevertheless, you can imagine the pressure is on for us to be able to produce data in this area. And that is extremely challenging um, because it's it's very hard to quantify exactly what it is we're doing. So I do find myself ambushing anyone who comes our way saying, do just tell me how this experience was for you. What impact has this had on you? Could you look at this Likert scale and say from one to five, how much better you're now feeling? There are some, um, some challenges around that and, and me being able to demonstrate impact, which is important. Um, but providing we are able to do that and people who engage with us understand that that is an important part of protecting our service, so far so good, I would say. And the other part is, is that we do also help create this legitimacy that protects the service by collaborating with other programmes. Also, this is nice for me because I get to give a bit of academic stretch um, by being involved in other bits of teaching, but the wonderful luxury of not being responsible for solely delivering music programmes. So all our resources can focus on the whole community. So we're very lucky and it's very odd. If you look nationally, the national picture is pretty sad in this area and there isn't really anything like the Centre for Music, a whole facility with rooms and spaces and staff and services. It's, it's unusual and hopefully we'll see more. And, and Kat, I'm not sure if you mentioned that it's free for students and staff, so it's not it's not a paid service in any shape or form. Um, I think we can, um, we've used the word serious leisure now. Um, let's figure out what that is and what leisure is serious. Sam. Thanks, Betty. Yeah, we haven't got long enough to get into that properly, have we? Let's be honest, we've been talking for months now, I'm still not really gotten to the bottom of it. Now, okay, so what we're talking about, when we say serious leisure, it seems or sounds, it might sound to you oxymoronic in terms of, well, hold on, you know, leisure for me, you know, for me or the, the general attitude towards leisure is anything but serious. But what we're talking about here is not serious as in, you know, that negative connotation or, you know, something around productivity or anything like that. It's really to describe an attitude or a commitment to uh, an activity or a set of activities that, uh, that we, we've invested ourselves in. So from a definitional perspective, serious leisure is the pursuit of one of, or a combination of three different types of leisure activity. Uh, they can be amateur, hobbyist, or volunteer-based activities, which in and of themselves are sufficiently substantial and interesting and fulfilling enough uh, that participants are, are engage in the long-term in them. So they develop a sense of identity and career-like involvement, so a leisure career, which is an interesting concept, which we can get into, um, but a, a career-like involvement with all the, with all the um, ups and downs a career brings with it, but in the, in the context of leisure. Um, so I, as I'm talking, I think we'll, shrimp, we'll, we'll kind of switch this around a little bit. As I'm talking here, I want you to be thinking about your own leisure. And Petty has asked you to drop uh, your thoughts in the chat there, but be be thinking about your own leisure and thinking about in terms of the language I'm using and the different, I'm going to talk about some of the key features or qualities of serious leisure just now. Can you see yourself in some of these qualities in the context of your, your leisure activities? So what is serious leisure? Well, we, we have the amateur actor or the amateur musician. We have the hobbyist sports participant or maker or tinker or craftsperson. We have the volunteer firefighter or teacher or 
just a voluntary or librarian. There's, there's, there really, really is a long, long list of these. And if you li if you go to the link that I dropped into the chat, the Serious Leisure Perspective website has a whole organogram, if you like, of the different typologies and what this actually looks like. So I don't need to go on and on and on. But in terms of those six qualities, then, uh, in terms of taking your leisure seriously, what, one of the key defining qualities of, of this is the occasional need to persevere. Uh, so to, and that might be to overcome certain challenges in terms of skill acquisition. Kat's already talked about the idea of being a novice in something and then developing that mastery or expertise. Very rarely do we switch into an activity that's new to us and become immediately expert in it. Think about those, those leisure activities that you feel that you have some kind of mastery or competence in and then cast your mind back to when you first started. Guarantee it wasn't a light switch job. You know, it's been over, the, over a number of years, you'll have navigated the challenges of becoming an expert or, or more expert, more, more um, competent in that, in that activity. Also, it requires, uh, well, the long-term commitment as well. So I mentioned about the career-like involvement. Think about those activities that you have a long-term association with. You might have left or gone back to, but it's something you have a long-term involvement commitment to. So that career-like involvement, peaks and troughs of a career as we would do in a, in a professional career, but so it's that long-term commitment too. And because of that, it requires significant personal effort. So using your acquired skills and knowledge to navigate the challenges of that particular activity. Um, and why, why is it that this core activity might be something that you feel like you should commit to or have committed to for uh, a long period of time? Well, that's normally because there's, there's a quite a few actually uh, durable benefits that you might derive from being involved in such a leisure activity. So anything from, you know, sense of self-actualization, actually reaching uh, maybe a different part of your potential, um, self-enrichment, self-expression, regeneration, and, and a whole raft of social in, uh, interaction and social belonging benefits as well. So these have all come through in various different guises and, and combinations through the conversations we've had with folk doing their own serious leisure. You know, it's really that, that composite mix of those different benefits which really hook you in but also keep you there um, and a big part of that is a unique ethos that that core activity might have for you as part of a broader social world so uh, we, we've got gardening now my my folks and I, I actually really enjoy gardening but I wouldn't say I'm serious about it my folks however my parents are very serious gardeners uh, to the point where they do open gardens every year you know, you can imagine the kind of stress and chaos. And I very much make sure that I'm not anywhere near the house at that point. Um, but that's the cut. So there's a, in the village they, they live in, there's a, there's a social world, there's an ethos about that. It's a, it's a village, uh, it's a cultural, subcultural thing, uh, which they bought into. And it's now a long-term engagement for them. Um, but also through that involvement, that long-term involvement, that unique ethos and commitment, uh, we tend to develop a strong sense of identity with the core activity, whether it be gardening or fly fishing or ultra running, believe it or not. Um, we've, we've had quite a few interesting and disparate examples. But really, for me, one of the big kind of defining features of that sense of identity is the fact that it's derived a, a strong sense of authenticity. Or it's, there's, a, there's an anchor. The anchor point there is that we feel authentically ourselves whilst doing these particular activities or feel like we might be able to explore more authentic facets of ourselves through that activity so you know cat and, and the music center is a wonderful you know everybody want i know that i would love to be able to learn x y and z uh musical instrument and we'll throw all of the usual excuses at you as to why, why that's not happened but i do love music and that's something that i feel is an authentic part of who i am and we find that that you know through the through the podcast particularly the, the specific examples of the choice of activity those core activities are a big part of that is because it allows us to explore that authentic sense of self so those those are the core qualities that serious nature is is an attitude it's a sense of commitment to a core activity so i want why don't you think about your own 
leisure activities that you you well you might not have divulged actually in terms of you might want to change depending on what we've just what we've just um discussed there but i wonder then in terms of uh kind of an open question to the group as we as we move towards a more kind of discussive kind of mode here i wonder whether you can see yourself in what i've just described are there are there leisure activities that you are yourself involved in that you would class as being serious in terms of your involvement in terms of that self-expression the kinds of rewards that you gain from, from that you want to jump in there cap I was just going to add to your question, Sam, for everybody, that if in fact, as you reflect, the answer is maybe there isn't, then perhaps we need to, we've got to ask ourselves why. why? <laughs> yeah. And what, what are the beliefs that we're holding that have got in our way? And yeah. there are undoubtedly logistical life challenges because we, we all know, don't we, how hard it is to make time. But mm -hmm. somewhere under there is a belief that has led to those choices. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to be brave and allow ourselves to challenge that and see what is the legitimacy of that belief that means we don't make any time for a serious alternative thing that feels truly authentic as well as our professional work. 